Hey, this is Firewalker, and today I'm going to have the opportunity to share with you some of the research I've been doing on the historicity of Jesus. The video I'm responding to is part two of three uploaded by Chris Russell on his conversion to Christianity. All three parts have video responses from the Fifth Lord Silence, all of which are linked in the description, and I would highly recommend watching. Because Silence has already and recently uploaded these responses, I already talked with him to make sure that I would not be stepping on any toes were I to specifically tailor my response to the historicity of Jesus. If you're unfamiliar with my channel, there may be a couple of things that would help to know moving forward. First being that I grew up in a pretty fundamental Christian household that I attended private school all the way from pre-K through college, which meant that on a weekly basis, I had church, Bible classes, chapel, and one semester in high school and one semester in college, I also had apologetics class. I don't actually remember going to school and not having a Bible class at all whatsoever. And total, I would say I was a Christian for approximately 20 years. All this is to say that when it comes to Christianity, I was and still am well versed. Though if you want to know more about my background, I would suggest taking a scroll through my list of videos. And I want to go ahead and apologize before we get started for how abruptly the historicity of Jesus section is. And this is because, for one, his part two video began abruptly, and also the section on historicity of Jesus just plain began abruptly. So brace yourselves and we should probably get started. So the first place I looked was the Bible. And uh, when I was younger, I'd always believed that the Bible was uh, a fictional story and didn't stand up to like the test of time, if that makes sense. Like it was a book written after when the things happened and there was no really real proof that they did happen or that the books were really that accurate. Uh, so I started to look into that and as it transpires there the Bible as a historical document is actually very legitimate uh, there's far more documentation from the bits included in the New Testament that were written close to the time that they occurred for example the Gospels were written between about 60 and 100 AD and the oldest surviving sort of segment or copy that we have is between 200 and 300 AD which is a 120, 220 year gap, which you could conceivably argue that, you know, oh, they were brought into existence afterwards and the stuff that happened it was sort of forgotten through time. And I'd accept that argument, but then I, and I accept that, and that was perhaps the viewpoint I had until I realised that Caesar's account of the Gallic Wars, so Rome's occupation of Gaul, which were written between 58 and 50 BC, uh, the oldest surviving copies we have of those are from the 9th and 11th century, so nearly a thousand years after they occurred, but I was more willing to accept uh, that Caesar's account as being truth than I was the Bible, which was quite hypocritical, and again was me sort of not wanting to believe that the Bible was true, and that's bad science. Well, Chris... If anything, I would say that that should make you doubt what you know about the Gallic Wars, not just accept the historicity of Jesus. Uh, I would also say when we start taking the Gallic Wars as gospel, you'll have to let me know. But delving into it a little bit more, it's worth noting that there are really three tiers of evidence into proving Jesus as Lord. First of which is would be proving that he was. Second, that he was who we think he was. And third, that he said and did what we say he did. As for the oldest surviving copies of text, that's going to be more towards tier three, proving that things happened the way we think they happened. Whereas it's my understanding that your video is more tailored towards proving he was a hyster historical person based on most of the evidence given and so that's what I'm going to focus on really. Now then let's go ahead and take a look at the evidence that we have for the Gallic Wars. Well first of all Caesar's The Gallic Wars is dated to have been written 
in a time where it would be possible for it to be an eyewitness account. Whereas for the Gospels, the earliest one is projected to have been written at the earliest, 70 AD. This is in no way an eyewitness account as the life expectancy at the time would have been 55 years at best without persecution, wars, famine, or natural disasters or anything like that. So for it to be written in 70 AD, you would pretty much have to be born the year that Jesus allegedly died in order to make that believably an eyewitness account. Of course, then it wouldn't be believably because you'd be too little to remember anything. So none of the Gospels are eyewitness accounts. They're not even dated to be eyewitness accounts, much less when we have the oldest surviving texts. Caesar's account of the wars were in circulation a minimum of six years after they were written because we have Cicero praising them in approximately 46 BCE. We also have Strabo, Strabo, uh, citing it in approximately 20 BCE. This is into circulation way earlier than any of the gospel accounts in the canon. Furthermore, when we're looking at the Gallic Wars, we're taking into account the political atmosphere of the time, and we're assuming there will be propaganda in it, which means that we're taking it as sort of a general outline of what may have happened, unlike how we're taking the Gospels, usually to be that this is literally exactly how it happened, and we're also going to ignore the contradictions therein. What you've said also fails to account for the fact that Caesar's account for the wars is not the only evidence we have for them. For one, there are coins that were minted celebrating Caesar's victory in Gaul. We also have found uh, in excavations proof of military camps in Gaul and also proof of Romans in Mont Castel, which I understand to be a place of some historical importance in the wars. And that's just to name a few. Now, if we were to take into account the cultural, religious, and literary atmosphere of the time Christianity arose, we're going to need to talk about a couple of things. The first of which is euhemerization, being the term for when somebody takes a mythical being, specifically gods, goddesses, deities, etc., and writes a historical account about them as if they were real people on earth. This was an extremely popular form or use in literature, beginning, I believe, with a book on how Zeus and one other god were actually kings, whereas we don't really think that actually happened. We also need to remember that Christianity arose during a time where messianic cults were a fad. Specifically, we should pay attention to mystery cults of the time and also earlier. Now, you have to forgive me, I don't quite have these memorized. The characteristics of a mystery cult. They always center on a savior deity who was a son or daughter of God, who underwent some kind of suffering by which they procured the salvation for all. Their deaths or trials were known as passions. Uh, let's see, they had, these cults had an initiation ritual in which one symbolically underwent the suffering the deity had endured. These cults also have a ritual meal in which the members are united in communion with each other and their god. Some specific examples would be the Isis cult. They have a book of the Acts of the Isis, of the Isis cult. Their initiation is a symbolic voluntary death by baptism when one is reborn. Your initiation becomes your new birthday and the priest who initiated you becomes your new father. We also have the Mithras cult who also had initiatory baptisms. The Eucinian cult had baptisms and even had 
substitutionary baptism that could be performed on behalf of the dead. Judaism had no baptisms pre-Hellenization. Some of the trends of mystery cults were syncretism, being that they were fusing religious beliefs with Hellenistic ideas, and monotheistic trends from polytheism to henotheism, where it's one god over all of the rest. And that's another debate entirely as to whether or not they believed that at the time. If you were to read Dr. Richard Carrier's book on the history of Jesus, that would help fill in the blanks. Also, I'll probably do another video to help fill in the blanks. Mystery cults also featured a shift to individualism and a focus on individual salvation versus the community, such as good crop, success in war, etc. And lastly, cosmopolitanism, being that they were opening membership to other races, classes, genders, regions, etc. One of the main problems in proving the historicity of Jesus and talking about Christianity is the assumption that this is somehow a unique religion, which isn't true at all. Justin Martyr in the second century said, we propound nothing new or different from what you believe regarding those whom you call sons of God. If anybody objects that our God was crucified, this is in common with the sons of Zeus, as you call them, who suffered as previously listed. It's really important to keep in mind the religious atmosphere Christianity arose in because everything in the New Testament, everything about Jesus had already been done before by other deities. I was told growing up that the important thing about Christianity and the best evidence for its truth somehow was that other religions had dying gods or prophets or whatever, but ours came back from the dead. Well, let's take a look at some other death and resurrections cults. We have Inanna and Dumuzi, also known as Ishtar and Tammuz. I'm going to butcher these names, just warning you, by the way. We have... Um, Baal and Anat, Marduk, also known as Bel or Baal or Baal also, Adonis, Osiris, Romulus, Zalmoxis, Dionysus, Zagreus, Nisitelius, and also Isodeitus, just to name a handful. The whole dying and rising theme began over a thousand of years before Christianity. It's nothing new, and it's nothing unique or special. And as for the literary quality, we have, who I will pronounce his name as Orion Origin, uh, stating, quote, The spiritual truth was often preserved, as one might say, in material falsehood. Keep in, keeping in mind, of course, that he's one of the people often cited for the history he of He also Jesus. said in his rebuttal of Celsus that an allegorical understanding of writings was common in pagan religions, Christianity, and Judaism. Now we have some background, we can continue. And it was also the style in the way that the Bible and Caesar's accounts were written. Caesar's accounts were very scrappy in the sense that they were, the grammar wasn't fantastic and the handwriting wasn't very neat, which sort of would lead to suggest that um, well, scholars believe that he was writing it uh, after battles in his tent um, in not much light where it would have been not brilliant to write. And the fact that they remain like this would, it gives it more credence, like more credibility in the sense that if you'd wanted your book to be perfect, you would have sort of handwritten it lovely, 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 all nice and neat. If you were sort of making it up, the fact that it's all a bit scrappy makes it more believable. And there's a similar thing, theme running there in the Bible, in that Jesus' empty tomb was discovered by two women. And at the time, women socially were the lowest of the low. Uh, if you wanted something to be believed, you wouldn't say that a woman said it. You would disbelieve anything a woman said. So if you wanted someone to believe a made-up story, you would say that you'd use men as your eyewitness testimony. But the fact that it was women who discovered Jesus' empty tomb, to me, suggests that it's 
a more of an accurate eyewitness account because it's so implausible that it makes it plausible. You know, that's actually an argument that tripped me up for quite some time, and it's definitely one I heard repeatedly uh, growing up in the environment that I did. But recently I realized they didn't exactly leave women as the eyewitnesses, though, did they? No, they had the men follow up with it. And it's the men's accounts that we're actually going with. So, in the end, women as the first people to see Jesus' resurrected body isn't really that big of a deal. And uh, this can further be accounted by how mystery religions become more inclusive. Also, cargo religions, which we'll talk about in a couple of points from now are more much more inclusive and uh lastly i think it's important to consider that there are 40 or more gospels that were written clearly not all of which have made it into the canon and there's a lot of disagreement about that whole how that whole resurrection thing went down about who was there who saw it what happened when was this where was this spiritual body physical body, etc., etc., etc. Please check out Bart Ehrman's book, The Lost Scriptures, for a little bit more information on that. So that was the Bible as a historic document. I could accept it that it was legitimate in the sense that it wasn't sort of made up and it had quite a lot of credibility. And the same applied to Jesus Christ. I doubted his existence as a real human, but I don't think there's a credibility scholar today, theistic or atheistic, who doubts Jesus' existence as a historical human being. Please allow me to present on the historicity of Jesus, Why We Might Have Reason to Doubt, by Dr. Richard Carrier, who has a PhD from Columbia University in Ancient History. He specializes in, in the intellectual history of Greece and Rome, particularly ancient philosophy, religion, and science, with an emphasis on the origins of Christianity and the use and progress of science under the Roman Empire. This book has passed peer review and is now or has been published, I should say, by a major academic press specializing in biblical studies, Sheffield Phoenix, the publishing house of the University of Sheffield. Uh, Dr. Carrier sought four peer reviews from major professors of New Testament or early Christianity, and two of which had already returned their reports, approving with revisions, and those revisions were made. Since two peers is the standard number for academic publications, they proceeded. Um, which if you, well, I'd accepted that Jesus was a real person, the Bible was, uh, written when people say it was written, that leads me to start questioning what happened in the Bible and whether that's true. And that gives us three possible explanations for what we see in the Bible. Uh, One, Jesus is a liar. Two, Jesus is mentally ill. Three, Jesus is the son of God. So we start with number one, Jesus is a liar. That doesn't explain the lack of the body in Jesus' tomb. Um, You could say, A, Jesus' body was in the tomb, in which case, uh, yeah, Jesus' body was in the tomb and the disciples just made it up, in which case, why did the Romans or Gentiles of the time not produce Jesus' body if they had it? Now, I know I haven't proven that Jesus is entirely a myth and not at all a historical figure, but I'm hoping that I at least showed that this theory deserves another look. If we were still considering that this whole Jesus thing could be entirely a myth or an allegory or taking place in the cosmos or whatever, this would be easily explained because there was no body to bring forward because the character didn't exist in real life. The characters in the story rarely object to whether or not the story is true. But even if we were to move forward, assuming that Jesus was a historical figure and that these events historically happened, then not producing a body would also be explained by a belief in a spiritual body resurrection. 
Carrier talks about this a lot in his book, but I'm just going to go ahead and bring forward a single quote that hopefully will, again, just prove that this would require further thought. Uh, this is, again, from who I will call Orion, who may also be pronounced Origin. Uh, he states that Jesus's resurrected body could only be seen with spiritual vision. It should also be considered that the exact same question could be asked about all of the other dying and rising saviors. If they didn't rise from the dead, then why did no one produce the body? Which means that Jesus' body must not have been in the tomb. Okay, in which case, uh, the disciples took the body and then made up all these stories about Jesus because they realised sort of they'd been hoodwinked and Jesus had been lying all this time and they wanted to save face. Well, all of the, the disciples, barring one, I think, were executed for their beliefs. Um, so if they knew it not to be true and they knew that they were perpetuating a lie, why didn't one, one of them, before they were crucified, say, yeah, sorry, we're making the whole thing up? Um, that, to me, doesn't add up. All that really means is that they died for what they believed. It doesn't mean that what they believed was true. Also, we don't even really know what they believed. Did they believe in the spiritual truth that was hidden in an allegory? Did they believe that this entire thing was playing out in the cosmos? Did they believe in a spiritual resurrection instead of a bodily resurrection? Or did they simply believe in the political cause that these stories supported? Now would also be a great time to go over cargo cults, which appeared on many different uh, Melanesian islands in around the 1900s that we observed it. And these were religions with a savior deity uh, featuring historicized mythical saviors. They were charismatic, apocalyptic cults, you know, the end is coming soon and what have you, uh, characterized by speaking in tongues, mass hysteria, prophesying, revelations, and schizotypal visions. They came from racially and culturally fragmented societies. For instance, I guess one good example of a racially and culturally, frag culturally fragmented society might be when uh, Jerusalem was annexed to Syria in 6 CE from the Romans. Uh, they stemmed from agrarian, especially feudal, societies where the cult would arise from the lower classes in opposition of the oppressive higher classes. They also came to be in situations where there was no possibility of military remedy. For instance, nobody beats Rome. And these are optimal conditions for martyrdom. We also know that martyrdom was praised at the time, sort of like uh, suicide bombing in with is Islamic extremists. Uh, you can see Dr. Jacaria's book on page 209, or also Acts of Pagan Martyrs. And the same argument can be applied to Jesus being mentally ill and deluded about the fact that he was the Son of God. It doesn't explain the rest of sort of the miracles he performed in the Bible, um, nor is there any sort of documented evidence that says that these things didn't happen. Like if Jesus didn't feed the 5,000 and sort of it was all made up afterwards, how come there's no accounts around the time sort of contradicting what that had been written in the Gospels? Well, first, we need to remember that anyone who is alive and old enough to remember anything during Jesus' alleged ministry was dead by the time the Gospels and the canon were written. They were really, really dead if you're counting the fact that if we're dating from the Babylonian Talmud's account of Jesus, the Gospels are 140 years late. That's, what, nearly three generations? Second, I would assume that this question would need to be asked of all of the deity figures who are said to have performed miracles anyways. Uh, some of whom would be Alcides, Osiris, and other gods of Egypt, Pythagoras, and other gods of Greece, uh, Quirinus and Prometheus of Rome, Apollonius, etc. What about their miracles? Does that mean they happened? Because someone must have 
said that they didn't happen at some point, and we don't have record of that, so they must be true. Now, I'm also going to take this last argument as the argument against rapid legendary development, for which I'm going to bring up cargo cults again. With cargo cults, things that were seen in visions or prophesied were believed to be historically true, not just in someone's head, within 15 years. Now imagine what would happen with 40. We also see where legends developed about Alexander and Augustus within their lifetimes. Legends developed about Ned Ludd, who likewise may not have existed, within 40 years. He had a following by 1818. You also need to remember that miracles were not an oddity to the religious culture of the time. And also, aren't there mentions of non-Christians working magic in the Old and New Testaments? I mean, in Exodus, we see Pharaoh's magicians working magic. And then, I think it was Acts, correct me if I'm wrong, where we see Simon performing magic, etc. So, the magician, sorcerer. Uh, it's not like magic was anything odd at the time. And we don't really believe in magic now, so... What would we say about that? And I've just realised I've forgotten option number four. Jesus was a normal person and people bigged him up after he died. Sort of like he'd lived his life as a normal sort of bloke and then everyone made up all this stuff about him afterwards. Uh, well, the Gospels were written between 60 and 100 AD. Jesus was believed to have been crucified between 30 and 35 AD. So there would have been people alive when Jesus was alive who... Um, were there when the Gospels were written and they would have been able to sort of say no, you know, I knew Jesus and none of that stuff happened and the fact that it didn't, there was no sort of contradictory accounts arising um, would make me hesitant in believing that were true Again, with the eyewitnesses I've already mentioned that the life expectancy of 55 years in the best of conditions without persecution or war or natural disaster would mean that the earliest known written canonical gospel of Mark would fall outside of a believable time period where it could have been written by eyewitnesses. And then we see in Galatians where the Jewish war from 66 to 70 CE apparently wiped out nearly all of the Jews in Jerusalem. So, I mean, that would definitely limit uh, the eyewitness accounts there. It would be a lot less likely that criticism stating Jesus never existed would have arisen at the time if it was understood to be an allegory or taking place in the cosmos or was revealed in visions. And once again, I am confused as to whether or not you're asking this question of all of the myths. Should there have been people to say, oh wait, that didn't happen by the time those myths arose? We see rapid legendary development, we've already covered that. And uh, what about urban legends? I mean, there's a lot of urban legends where there's different things are said, there's not a whole lot of, that didn't happen until Snopes.com. As for alternate accounts and criticisms, we have no credible source telling us what happened in the church in between 65 and 95, 64 and 95 CE, maybe even as late as 110 CE, to tell us what happened to these documents or anything, really. And then we also see Orion's account, or rather rebuttal, of Celsus where he states that Celsus says that Jesus was born of a woman who was convicted of adultery and then on account of his poverty sold himself as a servant in Egypt, whereupon he got some sort of magic ability that he then used to make himself seen as a god. And it would appear to me that he got this idea from the Babylonian Talmud, which puts Jesus ben Stada as having existed a hundred years prior to when the canonical gospels say he existed, born of a woman who was having an affair with what we believe to be a Roman soldier and got 
some magic in Egypt and was crucified for sorcery and leading Israel astray. I think those would count as alternative accounts, as would probably most of the 36 other Gospels written that didn't make it into the canon, or the 11 other Acts that didn't make it into the canon. I would consider all of those alternative accounts and criticisms. Which leaves the final option, uh, Jesus was the Son of God. And Jesus being the Son of God uh, explains everything in the Bible. And so, to me, from a logical standpoint, I could accept the existence of there being a God. Well, Chris, it seems to me like you're making the best decision you can based on the information you've been presented. Which is why I'm hoping that you'll keep in mind the three tiers of evidence. He was, he was who we say he was, and he said and did what we think he did. And require evidence for each of those stages. I hope that you won't completely discount the theory that Jesus is entirely a myth, that you'll do some more research into that. So let me explain how I'm going from believing as you do here to where I am now in the project that I'm working on now. Well, first of all, I left Christianity for reasons completely other than historicity of Jesus and stuff in the Bible. There were moral contradictions and other objections, which you can see in my very first video ever, free and honest, why I left Christianity. From that point on, I assumed or I believed that Jesus was probably a historical man that myths were then developed about. Until I saw this lecture from Dr. Richard Carrier on Aaron Ra's channel that I will link down below the video of the lecture that is. And so then I went to Lee Strobel's lecture on the case for Christ. I have a video on that, on the notes from that rather. And uh, from there I began my own search my own research into the topic. Not that it actually really matters to me whether or not Jesus existed because that doesn't have anything to do with why I left Christianity. And even if Jesus is entirely true, entirely historical person, and everything happened the way the Bible said that it did, um, I still I still wouldn't be a Christian for uh, many other reasons. However, I think it's worth looking into, especially when there are people being converted to Christianity based on the evidence for Jesus as a historical person. So my research project began in November. I am first reading Dr. Richard Carrier's book on the historicity of Jesus, which is clearly on the uh, written on, from the standpoint that Jesus is entirely a myth. From there, I'm going to read Bart Ehrman's book on the historicity of Jesus. I don't remember, I don't recall the title, but I will find it and link it in the description. And that one has the stance that Jesus was a man made into a myth. And then I'm going to actually read all the way through Lee Strobel's book on the case for Christ, with obviously the standpoint that Jesus is entirely historical and everything happened the way the Bible said it did. At that point, I'm going to start research into some other myths, other deities, etc., and see whether the same standard of evidence presented for the historicity of Jesus is met by other deities and mythical figures, or at least people that we currently believe to be mythical figures, if you're not a Christian. If they do, that means that the standard of evidence is too low for Christians to say that Jesus is the one true Savior, Lord, etc., etc., and all the other things, all the other things are, are false. So I'm just in the beginning of that. I'm hoping to have the entire project done by the end of the year. That's a little bit optimistic, but uh, I have faith in myself. I'm hoping that you, Chris, will take another look at the evidence and then come to your own conclusion, whether or not you agree with me. I haven't even come to my conclusion yet. I'm still doing the research on it. And as I said, my objections to Christianity are no way tied to the historicity of Jesus. So it doesn't really matter to me what conclusion you end up coming to. It just seems to me like you're making a decision based on the evidence and you don't have all the evidence. Chris, please feel free to contact me via YouTube or on my Facebook page or even my email is 
listed on my channel. It's firewalker92615 at gmail.com. I would love to be able to talk to you a little bit more as a person who's essentially your opposite. I started out Christian for about 20 years and I'm now an atheist versus your atheism for 22 years and now a Christian. Um, I think that we could both shed a lot of light on the subject. It'd be interesting to talk to somebody who's the flip side of my experience. So please contact me. I would very much enjoy getting a chance to talk with you about this. Everyone else, thank you so much for tuning in for um, this discussion on the historicity of Jesus. And please put your comments and questions in the comment section below. I look forward to seeing you guys next time. Thanks.